Good afternoon, folks. Good to be back. I hope everybody had a nice weekend here. Had a busy weekend, at least. I was doing a lot of uh, filming for uh, what you see on the uh, bench here today. Uh, this is the uh, knife sheath that I made for uh, a customer. He very kindly uh, sent me his knife so that I could make the pattern for it. I had never actually made one of these before, and I'm really glad I got the chance to because it was a lot of fun. Uh, if you have not made one of these, I recommend it. I, I can see why people enjoy doing these. Uh, there is a lot of, I would go as far as say almost unbridled creativity that you can do with these, because you can, you've got all the surface to just do anything with. You can get as creative as you want. And I had a lot of advice and inspiration from uh, Mr. Martin Carswell in Australia, kind of a legendary uh, knife sheath maker. Uh, he very kindly offered me some good advice on, uh, in particular, on fitting the welt and everything like that. Um, I've been watching him for a number of years now, and he's a very, very nice man, very approachable, and just a, a consummate craftsman, and especially when it comes to these. Uh, look him up, his name is Carswell Leather, C-A-R-S-W-E-L-L, -L, on Instagram. Um, I liken his work to, um, this is, this, <laughs> this is potentially the, uh, one of the nerdiest references I'll ever do on here, but, uh, in 1965, Jack Nicholas played in the, uh, the Masters Tournament, and absolutely shattered all of the records and, and won it quite handily. And one of the tournament co-organizers, uh, Bobby Jones, obviously himself no no stranger to tournament play, likened Jack Nicholas's performance to, quote, he plays a game with which I am unfamiliar. And I feel that way looking at most of uh, Martin Carswell's knife sheaths. Uh, he and I do the same thing. We work with the same material. But what he does is so dramatically different from what I do, and his skill level is so remarkable. It feels that way when I look at, at his work. So I was uh, I was privileged to be able to, to to be able to approach him and ask him for advice and also receive it. So that was that was very nice. So this knife sheath is made with uh, bridal leather and it has an inlay of local to me. It was actually tanned in my hometown, uh, calfskin. It was tanned in 1969, October 15th, 1969 is when this stuff was dated. And I have a, a small stash of this stuff that I save for special projects. Uh, and I felt this was uh, certainly a good uh, use for it. This is, a, uh, this is a dyed and burnished finish on the top here. I was pretty pleased with the finish I was able to get with that. I get uh, a good reflection of it there. So yeah, I was pretty, pretty happy with that. This is actually a very simple construction. There's only five, technically seven pieces if you count the inlay, but the back of it there, there's two, there's an interior piece for each side, an exterior piece for each side, and the welt, and that's about it. Yeah, his, his work is those patterned, that patterned burnished edge he did is, is just remarkable. I have never seen anything like that. I was pretty happy with using, uh, I used the cutout of the welt for the shape of the inlay. Here's my I'm not getting any light on here. I have two wallet pieces drying there, blocking it. But the uh, shape of the w of the inlay is identical to the welt, which incidentally is identical to the shape and size of the knife. 
So when the knife is in the sheath, the inlay perfectly represents the uh, the size of it, which is also handy for determining which way is up, because <laughs> it's kind of ambiguous. What a what a beautiful beautiful knife. My my good friend uh, Trenton sent me this knife. Now I'm kind of a kind of sad to have to send it back. I can't just keep it. But uh, <laughs> very very fun piece. If you haven't seen it yet, I did. Uh, film the entire making of this and put it on, on my YouTube channel, so check it out. You have uh, <clears throat> 20 minutes to spare. I think it ended up being my longest video yet, but it was nice to return to form. I hadn't got to do one of those for almost a year since July of last year. Uh, working at the paint shop kind of didn't give me a whole lot of time to do anything other than what I strictly needed to. So. I would not say it is typical to have a fancy sheath for a fancy chef's knife. This is definitely, it, it is in the same line as having a nice wallet. It is not something that you strictly need. You can certainly get something that's simply utilitarian that will do just fine. And from what I understand it, this knife spends most of its time in a drawer, so um, it is not the kind of thing that's going to get used very often. But I would not say, well, I wouldn't say it is typical. I wouldn't also say it's extremely unusual to get something for something this nice. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a nice sheath for just a basic Victorinox, but obviously by looking at it you can see that this is not a typical standard knife. So it makes sense that you would have something nice for this one. But for most of your regular daily cooking implements, I don't know. It's kind of ironic. I hang out in the Chef's Knives Discord and they very politely allow me to stay. Even though I um I don't really cook and I don't own any chef knives, but they still let me hang out there anyway. I kind of make up for it by posting a lot of cat pictures, and they seem to like that, so I guess I kind of pay my way by that. But it was nice to actually have some relevant uh, content to finally contribute to that community. Very, very nice fellas there. So, very, very cool stuff. Again, if you're, if you're on the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would agree, oil boss. If you're on the fence about trying one of these projects, definitely do it. It is... um. It is not as difficult as you would think. Basically, getting the margins down for it is, is the important part. So, yeah. This is my everyday chef knife. I carry it with me everywhere I go. Let me go put this away. <laughs> Actually, I have here... Here's the, uh, the remainder of that uh, piece of leather, and you can kind of see here. These are... Uh, these are basically uh, test swatches from the Ohio Leather Company, and they're all about this size. They're all about 8x11, 8x12, and I have about maybe 60 of them, and I kind of save them for special projects, but most of them are dated. Some of them are handwritten, like this one. Some of them actually have stamps, you know, tagged stamps on them. Most of them are from 1968 to 1969. A couple of them go back. The, the oldest one I had was 1952, and the latest ones are from 1971, when the tanner actually closed. Um, it's kind of nice now. There's a lot of talk about revitalizing that section because it is horrendously polluted. Uh, this tannery was one of the early adopters of uh, the chrome tanning process. And as you can imagine, uh, <laughs> operating in the early part of the, of the 20th century, they really didn't think much about environmental ramifications, so that place has been uh, treated very badly. But they've worked very hard for about the past decade trying to clean it up, and there is serious talk now about turning it into a park, which would be wonderful. Uh, so I have high hopes for that area getting revitalized and getting rebuilt. Uh, I think I'm about to be interrupted here. My mother has just pulled up. Yep, she's coming in. Hang on. She's going to be mad when she realizes she's interrupting my stream here, but she's, she just stopped at the Batterick's Butcher Block over in a, a Niles Mineral Ridge. For those of you local who know, and she's got me a bunch of bacon. So I'm sure nobody would object to me pausing to uh, receive bacon. But... Uh, yeah, hang on one second. I'll, I'll be right back.
All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I, I didn't expect to... She told me she was going to the, the butcher block today, and I didn't know when she was going, so she just kind of showed up with that. But I digress. Um, i trying to remember where I was. I think I was talking about the Leatherworks. Anyway, we should probably get on with the actual business of the stream today. Uh, Andy, I'm, I'm glad uh, you found the, uh, the stream very, very beneficial. That makes me happy to hear. All right, let's gather our thoughts and see what, what are we doing here. We're working on today. Let me put this away first. All right. Last week, we started this ring lizard wall. We got pretty far, actually. Got the interior all made up, got the exterior cut and glued and everything. So actually, we're, we're pretty much set to put this thing all together today. And there's really no reason we shouldn't be able to, to finish it completely. I took the liberty of doing a bit of edge painting before we got here, so I have a, a layer down on these pieces here. Uh, these still need to be finished yet, so I'm going to do that now. I have, on my on my edge painting process for stuff like this, Hello, Dawn, I'm glad you made it in. Glad you're here. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get down to business here now that you're here. So I've started edge painting these here. I have, uh, I have two layers of paint on these. One, one layer is uh, kind of thin and heat spread, and I put another thicker layer on top and just let it air dry. I'm going to heat spread it again, sand it with some finer grit sandpaper, usually about 600, and just put a light coating on top of it and then just dry buff it. So we'll, we'll do that now. I've got my filters warmed up already. And I'll see if I can get... If I can catch the shadow just right. You can see it. See here. That's eh, a little difficult to tell, but anytime you're drying a large amount of paint, uh, you oftentimes get a little trough that develops in the center there. There's a couple ways to get around that. You can hang it upside down. Uh, having airflow over it usually helps most often, but even, even then, sometimes if you have a lot of paint, which I did on this one, you'll still get that, so you kind of have to deal with that. I used to just block sand it down. I've come to find that I, I actually prefer heat spreading it because then I don't actually lose any paint. I'm not really removing any of my surface there, like I would be with a, with abrading it away. I'm just going to lightly take my fill tooth, go over the top here, and I'm just spreading enough paint to fill that low spot. If you're heat spreading more than one layer of paint, you have to be careful, because it's very easy to... Uh... I'm trying to think of how to explain it. It's very easy to get solvent popping. What that is, that's when solvent comes up through the uh, the bottom layers of the uh, of the paint, and instead of having a, a a liquid surface to transition into the air, it doesn't anymore. It has a hard surface, and it bubbles up, and the bubble pops, and it leaves a small crater there. And that's more of a problem with automotive paint and an airflow issue. But with heat like this, you get. Uh, you can get a bit of that here, so you kind of have to be careful. You don't really want to apply too, too much heat to it, or it's going to cause more problems than you're solving. So that one there is good. Do this one here, and then, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna do a light sanding of this. Take away any any tool marks, and then we'll put another light coat of paint over there, just pretty much for color consistency. Is all we need to do. Because with this being white. You can burn it a little bit and you get some you know, light and dark spots in it. Obviously, that's not really what you want to see in the middle of your white paint. That should be good there. And like I said, we're going to use higher grip for this. These edges are pretty true. We're not really looking to take out major surface defects or, or, you know, true them up. They're pretty much already done. So I'm just going to hit this with a little bit of 600.
Okay, that's great. We're not done yet. We're gonna we're gonna clean up the paint because obviously with sanding it, you kind of go through on the edges a little bit and you leave visible marks there. So we're gonna put a very very thin coat of paint over top of that. And as everybody always makes fun of me for, I usually just do it with my fingers. We really only need a teeny tiny little bit, just about that much is, is all we're gonna use for most of this. Get it spread out there real quickly. Wipe it down the edge there. And again, all this is doing, this is just applying color consistency. It's not building at all. It is only color coverage. Cleaning up some of the marks from the filatus. Edge, make sure we don't have any spilling over, which on this one we do not. We're good on that one. And within about a minute or two minutes, that will dry up to the point where we can actually dry buff it, and then those interior edges will be done. And then with that done, these, these are ready to go. These are ready to attach to the interior here. The interior of this, if you didn't, uh, if you were not here last week, I'll give you a real brief rundown on, on what this is. It's very simple. We're using Ring Lizard for the outside and for the inside. This is the center of the belly. These are the flanks. The, uh, we get this nice transition from black to white on the flanks there. Uh, I thought that would be nice to use on the interior here. They're going to be paired with Black Delaro, which is basically the whole structure of this wallet on the inside here. Kind of accent that black and white ring lizard on the outside there. So this whole interior and the exterior, the, the entire structure of the wallet is actually just two pieces. We've got about a, a 0.8 to 1 millimeter thick piece of Delaro which actually is primarily what the structure is. Glued to that around the edges, and you can see the flex there, is the ring lizard. It's only glued about maybe on the outer half inch, and that lets it fold nicely and also flex when it opens, because you need that extra space there. You can see how it kind of pops up in the center there. You need that to be able to open the wallet without it wrinkling horrendously. That's why we do that. But most of the actual structure of the wallet is actually coming from this piece here. It's just a single piece. On some, some cases, I will use um, an extra piece of salamander or salpa in here. Salamander is, is not the actual animal. It is a, it's a term for the bonded leather uh, piece that we use for structures or reinforcements or things like that. Occasionally, I'll use that for the interior. On this one here, it is specifically intended to be a front pocket wallet, so thickness matters quite a lot. So I opted, even for an extra half a millimeter, I opted not to have it. The uh, Delaro is stiff enough to where it will do it nicely. If I was doing this with goat skin or something like that, I definitely would have used the Salamander or Salpa for the structure rather than the goat skin. But this being a nice veg tan cow skin, and especially having this pattern stamped into it, it gets extra dense and extra compacted, very stiff. Uh, it was good enough just by itself. Let's take a look at this here. These should be dried now. Yep, perfect. So we're just going to take a dry canvas. And by dry, I mean I have different canvases that I use. I have some that I term dry, which have no wax in them, and I have others that I would term wet that have wax in them. And it's a big difference to make when you're edge painting, because occasionally when dry buffing, I will actually have to go over and put another coat of paint on them. I don't think I'll have to do it on this one, but it is, it is a process that I do when I'm slowly smoothing out sanding marks or things like that. I will buff the paint and then still add paint over the top of it. Obviously that would be a big problem if you were applying wax to it because wax is the natural enemy of, of paint adhesion. So I keep them strictly separate. I have my dry cloth and my wet cloth. This is a dry cloth. And again when I use the term dry buffing it also means that I'm not applying any wax to it. I'm literally just taking cloth directly to paint and that's it. And just using direct friction applied to the surface of the paint. If you notice when you're edge painting that you get little dirt nibs and things like that, um, this is a good process for removing that. You'd be surprised how much of that will come out with just an, an aggressive buff. Uh, especially with Uniters and, and Fenice or Fenice, um, those paints respond extremely well to this process. And again, talking about buffing and having to sometimes put an extra coat of paint on it, uh, I came across a high spot there. So if you look very closely, you can kind of see where there's a dark spot where I actually I buffed through the paint. So there was a ridge there that I had filled that I had forgotten about. So if I had been doing this with a wax impregnated cloth, 
it would have been very difficult for me to go back over and re-sand this and reapply paint to it. Just because this is dry means I can do it without worry, but if that had been waxed, it would have been a whole other story. This one here, let's see how this one turns out. This one. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do them both. I'm gonna step up a grit again. I'm gonna go from 1600. I'm gonna do it with 1500, which is just enough, just enough abrasion to get good adhesion, but also really not adding any additional sanding marks or other things that we would then have to take care of. Kind of got hung up this morning. I was hoping to have all of this done already before the stream started, but I wasn't paying attention, and here we are. So you get a little bit of an edge painting lesson today. Probably the least exciting part of leatherworking. But very critical. A good general rule for uh, leather goods. If you're trying to determine the quality of the goods, or objectively measure the quality of them, Looking at the edges is a safe bet. That's where most of the time and dedication has to go to make them look good. Somebody who is just kind of going through the motions versus somebody who is really taking their time to make it look nice, you will be able to tell a difference. So I always am able to judge leather goods by the edges and how they're, how they're dressed. Are they dressed at all? If they're dressed, are they done nicely? That is the, the determining thing there. I'll let those dry for a little bit more. While we're doing that, there are a couple of things we can do. Let me get my template out. Hang on one second. While we're waiting for that, we can do some important things here. I'm going to mark out where our pieces have to go. Before I do that, I'm going to square up these edges. And by that, I mean I've got a little bit of, you can see here, I've got a little bit of the Delaro peeking out over the edge of the ring lizard. I'm going to trim that back. Because I'm measuring from the inside. Nothing would be more embarrassing than trying to put this together only to discover that I've glued these in a place where there is no lizard on the outside. I've, I've missed my margin. We're going to clean up these margins a little bit. They should all roughly be about an eighth of an inch oversized. We'll be able to tell for sure when we lay our pattern down. So yes, perfect. So you can see they're very, very close, roughly about an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch additional space on the outside edge, which is perfect, because that means when we glue these down together, we can trim them all flush and get a really nice, clean, smooth edge from that. I'm going to mark this out with a gel pen. These gel pens are not good. I, uh, I ran out of my usual gel pen, and I stopped at uh, Joann's. I bought two there. And these are, these are just terrible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. <laughs> this is a white gel pen versus black. And it's going to be good to start with, and in about a minute... It's going to flash down so much to where this white is almost transparent. My old ones, you could see them for, from a mile away. These ones here, I don't know what the deal is. And it's not like they were cheap. They were, they were no less expensive than the ones I'd already bought on Amazon, but I, I, I don't know. I like using the gel pens because they, uh, when they're good, they're very visible. And you can leave a mark without having to uh, scribe a line, like with a scratch -all. That's a If you do it with a scratch that is an absolutely permanent, irrevocable mark. Whereas these ones here, as long as you're not pressing too hard with the pen, you can always go back and wipe it off with a, you know, a damp towel. I notice as well, on my template, I have these interior lines. These mark where the interior edges of the card slots go. So I know that when I place them there, have a reference point for both the inside edge and the outside edge. There's the margins for our, our wallet there. You can see already on the bottom we're starting to, to 
flash down a little bit and lose that line. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know what is going on with that. That's damnably frustrating. These are dried up. So now that I put a little more paint on it, I'm going to be a little bit less aggressive with my buffing. Feels good. I agonized over whether to do these inside edges in white or black. And I'm still not 100% sure. I think the white looks best against this, but I, I haven't seen it yet against the, uh, the interior etchers. That's another reason why I'm not putting any wax on these yet. I want to get a look at them actually kind of more finalized than against the, the black here to make sure that, yes, the white is good, or no, we don't like the white, we want to go with something else. Kind of leave your options open until the uh, the, the bitter end there. That. Upon first glance, I like it very much, actually, which is good. I think that works. I think that works, actually. Give me a second. I'm going to clamp these in place and show it on camera. Don, I'll give you a chance to sound off yay or nay here. I think yay, but let's see here. Let's give you a quick look. I would say that it is the uh, the most important part of it. Because when you're doing stuff like this, you have all these layers of things that go together. You have to you have to dress them somehow, and you can have a very nice piece that is completely let down by poor edge work. It's it's certainly the least glamorous, most definitely. Even even burnishing, I find, is much more exciting to watch than uh, edge painting. Just because hell, I mean, you get to see something happen. Edge painting, you're literally just watching and waiting for it to dry all the time. So here's what we're looking at. And it kind of shifted a couple of different ways there. I think the white interior edge works. Because it actually surprisingly blends very well, even with that black transition there, and even against the black Delaro. It's consistent with the colors we've picked. It's consistent with the colors that are on both pieces. I think the white is good. I think the white is a go. I like that. I like the white. I think that's the one. It's funny that you asked that, Oil Boss. Uh, I'll let you guys in on a little secret about that video I posted the other day. It shows me using the black dyed tokenol for the edges on that knife sheath. And that works okay. But you know what's a lot better to use for dyeing for dyeing an edge black? Is uh, <laughs> a black Sharpie. So solid paint markers, no, but the Copic markers, Oil Boss, are fantastic. They are, they are absolutely top tier for edge dyeing. And I haven't, um, I don't do it enough to, to buy a bunch of them, but I know that it always makes my, my artist friends cry when I tell them, uh, oh yeah, Copic markers are great for just dyeing the edges there, because they, they're such a nice alcohol dye. They work very well. They penetrate the fibers very well. So and a solid paint marker you would not want to use because this paint is very special. It's actually kind of a rubberized, flexible paint. It is not like other paint. It's not like chalk paint or things that you would paint on like a window or something like that. All of that is too brittle and will flake off. This is some kind of special chemical formulation that allows it to bond, but also to flex. I don't quite know how they did it, but, but they did it, damn it. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you think so, Don. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that I, I keep thinking in my mind, it reminds me of a car I did, um, in which he did it with a black metallic exterior, which kind of, you kind of get some of these colors here. And then on the interior, he had done all white seats with black stitching, black piping, and black buttons. And it was tuxedo, he kept calling it. That's kind of kind of the vibe I get from this. I get a tuxedo-ish vibe from this arrangement. This is going to look... Even right now, it looks good with the edges all roughed up. When we get these edges trimmed, it's going to be remarkably different. In a, in a good way. <laughs> Let's double check. All our alignment looks good. Mark out here. 
just checking make sure that my margins are all visible are okay check the other one it's very hard to tell you can just barely see it but when i was working on this last again because my my pens were so bad i just marked them with a pencil that actually held up pretty okay pretty visible against the white so i'm just looking I'm just laying my template over top and just double checking and make sure that all my lines are marked out properly and all my guidelines are present. They are. Everything looks good. We can go ahead and start preparing these for glue. I'm gonna stir my glue real quick. I try not to shake it because uh, I'm reaching down in there with my glue spreader. And I try not to shake it to the point where it actually reaches the neck of the bottle, otherwise it just makes my glue spreaders a mess. I just kind of stir it like this. Oh. It also prevents bubbles from forming. So using our guidelines here, we're just going to take the scratch all. Scuff up in the surface here. Another very unglamorous part of leatherworking, but no less important, is the scuffing. Unusually for this stream, uh, normally I, I stop them before I get to this point, but I'm actually going to have a lot of stitching to do today. Uh, basically, you know, the whole perimeter, and that'll probably take a good half hour to 45 minutes. Um, I don't really have much to talk about. So I would say if you have questions about anything, hold them until then when I have nothing to really show or talk about, so we can actually have something relevant to discuss while I'm just sitting there stitching interminably. Unless you just want to take a nap, which is also fine. I, I love stitching. I, I find it very soothing. But I'm also the one doing it, so I, I imagine that it's probably far less exciting uh, just to watch. <laughs> so I'll apologize in advance for uh, the lack of excitement coming later in the stream. Normally I would try to talk about something I'd done over the weekend, but I really didn't do anything at all. I kind of worked on that knife sheath, and then I just got tired and took a break all weekend. All right, there's our scuffs there. Oh, that shows up perfectly, yeah. So that there, that's going to ensure our bond to this side of the leather. We're going to do the same thing to the back side of these parts here. Kind of eyeballing where those go. And about to there. I always get nervous doing this, because I tend to just do it very quickly, almost sometimes without thinking, and I'm always paranoid that I'm going to start scuffing something that is the surface that actually has to be shown. <laughs> I very frequently have to stop myself and like look at what I'm doing and make sure I've picked the right thing. Because that would be incredibly embarrassing to just take a, a sharp tool and scratch the hell out of the thing we've just spent all this time making. So far it hasn't happened yet, but I don't rule it out as a possibility. I would say that's, um, people seeking leatherworking advice, I would say that's probably the biggest thing, is just slow yourself down. Slow yourself down and force yourself to really think about what you're doing. You'll usually get a better result out of it. Even if it takes a little bit longer, you can avoid a lot of mistakes. Did you really? Yep. <laughs> See, everybody, uh, here, I'll show you. I'll show you something I did. Oh, this made me, I was unhappy. I'm still working on these guys. 
these uh the set of the kind of summery spring covered walls. So this looks pretty good, right? This is this is nice. I like this. It could have been better because uh, here we go. It could have been better because the head and the neck had these really nice scale patterns. Except um Yeah. Need something white. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, can you see it? We could have had that nice, beautiful, transitional gradient pattern there, but nope. And then I even thought, ah, oh, maybe I can salvage it with it. Oh, nope, I can't. So, you know, that's unfortunate. This was a very thick, look at how thick that, that's a sixteenth of an inch thick. That's almost like four ounces, almost five ounces thick. Alligator. I've never seen one this thick. This one came from, uh, it was, it was hand dyed in Japan. I got this from Jay Hartke. And, um, I don't know why this one is, is such a thick, thick skin. Very different from the ones I usually get from Amtan. But anytime you're splitting alligator, that is, uh, that unfortunately is the risk you run. So, keep that as a little memento there. So, I was unhappy about that. <laughs> but I think the final result will be well worth it so these are going to be really pretty to photograph together I had to take a break from them to uh, make that knife sheath and a couple other things I'm hoping to finish those up probably tomorrow then back to regular rescheduled customer orders yeah, I was splitting it down. When you're doing those, I try to split them down to about uh, half a millimeter, which you can imagine, it's it's fairly risky. So that was, what you saw there was the reason why I didn't stream that one week when I was making that, that red uh, uh, money clip wall all out of alligator. That's why I didn't stream it. And miraculously, I didn't really do much of that at all on that red one. It, it split just fine. I managed to get through the whole thing really without ruining anything, which was a, a great relief for me because it was uh, irreplaceable. I do not have a splitter. I did that on the Bell Skyver, Dustin, which is not something it is really intended to do, but it can do it. It's not happy about it, but it does it. I had hoped when I was doing this uh, transition into this full time, I had hoped that I would be able to actually sell my business rather than closing it altogether. And uh, my plan had been to take some of the funds I made from the sale of the business to invest in a splitter. But obviously that didn't happen. I just had to walk. So those plans are, are dashed for a little bit yet. But eventually that is in my future. For what I do, I, I really do need one. Number one, just to be able to, to have easy access to materials from overseas. And I have to worry about having a third party split it. That would be a huge benefit. So it is in my future. I just unfortunately do not know when. I always know I can run down to, to Louisiana and use Ben's splitter if I have to, but um, or up to uh, Toronto and use Steve's. But so far, the Bell Skyver does me okay. I usually order just from Rocky Mountain Leather, and they're pretty good about splitting it for the most part. Some people have trouble. I seem to have no trouble at all with them. I seem to be blessed with that. I'm just going around right now and looking for any signs of delamination, anything that needs a little bit more glue before I put it all together, just to make this simpler, once it's all in one piece. Here. Hello, Rushton. I didn't try to split it on the bell. I did split it on the bell skyver. I split everything on the bell skyver, all the alligator. All, all four of those were all split on the bell skyver. Now, actually, there's a... Uh, one of my video, the last video I did from last year, July, uh, has me doing that. The process of me doing one of those wallets with the glaze instead of matte alligator. 
if you're curious about that, you can take a look at it and see how that's done. On this wall, the fortunately, the lizard is already very thin, so there was no need to split it. I was able just to take it directly and glue it to the backing, which I was, uh, <laughs> needless to say, I was grateful for. Right, I think we're ready to... Put these together now, or at least get some glue on them. For these pieces here, again, I'll be using the, uh, the Aqualim contact glue. And I just find that uh, calf skin and chrome tan and things like that generally bonds better with this glue than with the, uh, the, the usual Sewa PVA glue. Russian, my good friend, how are you? The calf skin I got from this is actually from my good friend Russian. From Spain to England to the United States, what a marvelous modern age we live in. Russian, I was saying earlier that, um, Unusually for this stream, I'm going to be doing a lot of stitching later here. I've, uh, I've not got a lot to discuss. I didn't do much this weekend. I was hoping, was hoping that somebody would give me something to talk about. If you have any suggestions, let me know. And likewise, if you guys have any questions or topics you'd like me to uh, expound upon, that would be a great time to do it. I do appreciate the company. I really enjoy streaming on Mondays. It has been a nice way to frame the week. Now, somebody remind me when I go to glue these together. I do you believe I specified a top and a bottom for this? I did. I do have a top and a bottom. But when I skived this, when I skived this black Delaro, there is, I did it on three out of four sides. So this top part is a little bit thicker than the bottom, just because there's a little bit less thickness here. I um, They do make left-handed versions of the skiving knives. Mine is most decidedly a right-handed version, but I don't find that it bothers me too much. The biggest thing I had to work around was the Philatus tips, which is why I use the round tip. It works in either hand. The other ones definitely are, are intended for right-handed users. But otherwise, that seems to be the only problem I have with it. Fortunately, with the bell skiver, I, I, I use my skiving knife so rarely it um, really doesn't factor into it too much. But yeah, I'd say definitely the, uh, the fill tooth tips are the biggest impediment to, to being left-handed. They do make left-handed creasing tips, but, you know, all the things cost an arm and a leg to begin with. I wasn't about to go buying another whole set of them just to be able to use my, my hand with them. Just had to make do. Otherwise, no, I, I can't think of anything else for it. That should be good there. We'll let that glue tack up. While we're waiting for that to dry... Oh, nope, I turned the full tooth off already. I'm going to heat spread some paint, but no dice. I guess we'll just have to sit here and wait for the glue to dry. <laughs> Shouldn't take too long. These ones have already tacked up. You can tell they're ready when you can't see the white anymore. When the white turns clear, that means the glue is tacked and ready to be bonded. Should make a note. Top, which is the bottom. This is the bottom. This is the top. Very good. Um, I wouldn't say it's controversial at all. I'd say it's very important, and I don't think it gets talked about enough. 
uh, people generally don't like to talk about money and things like that. Uh, I guess I've been doing it so long, both, you know, I've been doing this for six years, and I've been, you know, self-employed for the past 15 uh, at the paint shop. So it, um, it, it comes naturally to me to, to talk about it, but there's always something to learn. Uh, I, I struggled early on with imposter syndrome, basically coming down to uh, I didn't think my work was that good. I didn't think it was worth pricing what it should have been priced at. And uh, it oftentimes is a race to the bottom. That's, that's a very good way of putting it. A, a good friend of mine, a very dear friend and colleague, Jason Paris from Paris Leatherworks, uh, he really kind of kicked me in, in the rear end about pricing my goods higher and more, you know being more fair to myself. And the important thing to remember is that in pricing your goods accurately and fairly, it is not fair just to you, it is fair to your colleagues as well. And that almost kind of makes it sound like you're getting into a bit of a cartel kind of situation. But everybody, you know, people who are serious about pursuing this and want to be paid fairly for it, have difficulty competing with people who are either don't understand or intentionally price their goods down at the bottom of the barrel. You know, why would you, if you're making um, a certain kind of product and you're selling it for 60 and somebody's selling it for 30 or 20, obviously you're going to have difficulty fighting that. And that hurts not just yourself, but you know it hurts the other people too. So it's important to to understand what your what your value is and what the value of your goods is. Um, I generally I'll, I'll put it this way to you. I generally try to price my myself. I try to get um, for exotic goods. They usually take me anywhere from eight to ten man hours to do. Sometimes twelve. Uh, depending on how complex it is, but I generally kind of average it out at about 10. I try to make about $30 an hour for my wage. So I try to budget in at least 10 man hours of time, 300 bucks, and then material cost on top of that, which usually puts alligator wallets and things like that in anywhere from the five to $800 range, usually dependent on the materials being used. And for, that seems high, and it certainly is not inexpensive, but compared to what... Uh, Compared to what uh, you know, Gucci and Louis Vuitton and all the others are asking for their alligator wallets, it's quite a deal actually, and it's still that's a fair price to other makers. You, it is okay to compare yourself to other people that are doing this full time and figure out you know where you should be priced for it. So it certainly could be higher. Um, I kind of keep it at a point where you know the volume matters. I can't price myself out of work. I have to keep it accessible, and I find that's a good balance. My my real advantage here with me being full time is not the fact that I that I make a lot of money, it's that I really have very low costs, and that I think is something that people don't talk about too much. Uh, I don't buy a lot of leather unless I know what I'm going to do for it, unless I know I can make money from it. You can see I'm kind of I'm pretty simple when it comes to tools. You know, people go, oh, you got to have the best knife. I have a an eight dollar, hundred year old Stanley knife that I use for everything. Um, Learning about what you need and what you don't need is important. Being able to parse what is what is valuable to you and what is not matters a lot. If you hang out in the in the Leathercraft Discord, as good as it is, they unfortunately kind of get into the tendency of of having trends and fads where oh I got to use this leather, I got to have this tool, I got to have this, I got to have that, and ninety percent of it they don't need. Uh, I kind of I kind of get laughed at for telling people ah you don't need that stuff, save your money. But uh, controlling your costs is just as important as, uh, as pricing yourself accurately. When it comes to pricing goods, it, it's important to um, be realistic about your capabilities. And if you want to get higher, higher dollar amounts for it, you have, to be, you have to become very good at it. So it's important to uh, self-critique and always be aware of what you can improve and always be trying to improve yourself. Um, I, I say it quite bluntly. I try to be the best. And I have a long way to go from, from becoming even even in, in the same world as some of the best people who've been doing this you know, for 30 some odd years. But the important thing is that you try. And having that mindset of being everything should be better than the last thing you made is uh, is how you kind of get there. At least I think. that's That's been my personal philosophy. Always do better than you did last time. And never never be truly satisfied with what you're doing. Be happy with what you make, but always be aiming to make it better than you did. I think our glue's set up now.
before I do that real quick, I'm going to give one last look to our edges here. Yep, these look good. I'm going to dress these with a bit of wax. That's an interesting topic, and I, I think we'll, I think we'll come back to that. I need to uh, to clarify my thoughts on that a little bit. So I think I'm gonna think on that for a little bit, and we'll come back to that during the stitching part when I've got nothing to really do. Just double checking, making sure. Yep, I've got the got the bottom down. Go ahead, line that up. Good. Other one here. And as I'm doing this, I'm paying careful attention not only to line it up, obviously, with these marks here, but I also want to make sure that I'm lining it up properly so that the card slots aren't, you know, askew or things like that. They, sh they should be lined as well. Multiple things to account for when doing that. Yep. Yep. Good. Well, don't bravo me yet. I still have to trim this. And that's going to be the frightening part. <laughs> note about hammering in a lot of cases it is better to use the hammer than like the glass slicker to spread it down and a, and a very um a relevant case for that was actually the knife sheath doing the inlays you'll notice when i when i go to press them i most of the time i'm hammering them down and the reason for that is when you're using a glass slicker and you're using this kind of pressure it would be very difficult to do it on this leather, but on the bridle, it is a little stretchy in places. Even you know, even you know, proper you know, not not even getting into belly or, or neck areas. It, when you're putting tension down and stretching it like that, you can distort it, and obviously that would be extremely bad with the, how tight the inlay needed to to sit. So, in cases like that, you may be better off using just straight downward percussion to set the glue rather than trying to use something like this. I'm going to hit the head real quick and I'm going to brew a quick cup of mint tea. So let's take uh, about a minute or two. We'll be right back. When we come back here, this glue will be fully cured. It, it's very quick. We are ready to go ahead and finally trim this to the, to the real intended shape. And then we'll get a finally a true look at how this is supposed to appear. So give me about two minutes. We'll come back here and uh, we'll, we'll do some real frightening cuts and then we'll hopefully have a nice... Uh, Nice looking wallet when we're done with it here. So I'll be right back.
I'm back. Sorry about that. You may have heard me mention before I left that I said I was going to get a cup of mint tea. And uh, regrettably, I discovered that I had neglected to refill my water boiler. So there was no hot water. Damn. But the good news is our glue is most certainly dry now. Before we do any cutting, we're going to do some checks. Use our template. Sure. We have all of our lines marked out where we can easily see them. And it looks like I did this very, very, very closely. Makes me happy. All of my lines are pretty much right where they should be. Make them a little more visible. I think this is the first time I've ever had to use pencil to mark leather before. But it is working, so... There we go, that's pretty... That's about as good as I think I'm going to get. Uh, as for your question about pricking irons, ask me again uh, during the stitching. We'll, we'll come down to that. But it, uh, to answer your question quickly, uh, no. <laughs> I do not think, other than the extremely obvious parts of it, uh, no. I generally don't think they matter that much. All right. I think we're ready to do this. I'm going to change my knife out. Only the freshest of blades. Something like this. The newer ones make this a lot more convenient, but I find they are just too big for my little hands. This knife ended up being the actual perfect size to fit my hand. I tried the new ones. They just don't do it for me. We're going to start with the easy one first. Where's my tape? The tape's got to be right in front of me. Where is it? It is literally right in front of me. There it is. Using my, my low-tack tape. Put a couple lines down. Again, we're putting it down on the outside margin. So that even if we do, in the extremely unlikely event, have some uh, lifting of the grain, which would be almost impossible with this. That way, even if we do have some of that when we lift the tape up, it's on something that's going to get trimmed away anyway. Start with, we'll do the straight lines first, why not? Good. Proper. Yep. And I'm not necessarily trying to cut through in one stroke. I'm just kind of letting the knife... Almost letting gravity kind of pull the knife down through. The lizard being, you know, reptile skin is a little dense and kind of tricky to cut. And I find that, at least with me sometimes, if I try to cut through all in one go, I have more trouble doing it that way than if I just make multiple cuts. I tend to just kind of take it easy and let the knife do what it's going to do at its own pace, and you get through it eventually.
Bottom now. Again, using a long ruler because it flexes on the on the front and back, and it lets me kind of put even tension across the whole piece rather than rocking back and forth if it was something thicker. Our front and back. Ooh, I like the unintentional, but I like that it kept. I don't know why I'm pointing with my middle finger there. Excuse me. I like that it kept these two little white flecks down there. I like that it kept these two little flecks down there. <laughs> What am I doing here? But now the fun part. And it's a little tricky for you guys to see just because that is a pencil mark there. But you probably can at least see that it is a rounded edge, which is kind of my signature for these. And that's a lot of fun to trim. So. You know what? Let's just do it. I'm gonna. I am going to anchor the piece down. Just gonna trace it again real quick. Give myself a little more visibility. I fear that's as much as I'm going to get on this. So be it. I try not to cover it up with my big old head, but... It's actually cutting very well. The biggest hindrance is just the fact that it's so darn hard to see. That's really the biggest trouble. Almost through. Obviously, the downside to making that many cuts is you lose some of the nice flushness that you would not just doing a single cut there. But not to worry. That's easily resolved. A little bit of extra trimming with the knife and our planer later on will really trim that down. Let's... Shut up, Rushton. <laughs> There's all the layers of our our wallet there. We have the outer, the Delaro inside, the liner for the pocket, the Salpa that is the actual structure of the card slots. Here's the top visible lizard. Here's the liner for the top pocket, the outer visible lizard. The advantage of trimming it all together when you're putting these together, when you're gluing and hammering and fitting them, there is a little bit of variance. Things shift uh, when you're accommodating, especially like I do it with cards inside the slots here. Unless you were very good and spent a lot of time figuring out the exact measurements for it, which would also vary depending on the thickness of the leather itself, 
you would almost never get a true perfect flush edge if you were to just trim these to size and then assemble them. Um, it is much, much easier, if a little bit messier, to put it all together and then trim it. And obviously figuring that out kind of has its own tricky parts, but I think it's easier to figure out how to trim it afterwards than it would be to figure out the exact measurements for every different thickness of leather to fit together just right without any work on it. I, I, in my experience, this is the best way of doing it. Thank you, Russian. That's a very kind, kind compliment from you. I'm sitting here thinking that I'm done, except I have a whole other side to do. So let's, let's crack on with it. And I'm going to, I'm going to retrace my line there just to try to get some more visibility from it. Well, I'm very glad to hear that I passed the dandruff check. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very vain about my hair, you know, Russian. Yeah, that's kind of how I do it. There are certain guide guide pieces that I'll use that, that are exactly to size, and everything else is cut to that size. That's how I did the uh, the knife sheath. I kind of cut the interiors to, to perfect fit, and then everything else was sized around those, if that makes sense. This one, for whatever reason, I can see a little bit better. Oops. Almost bad. Definitely don't need it shifting. That'll need a little bit of cleanup, but not much. But now, at last, we finally have a clean shape to this wallet. It's amazing how different that looks already. I really, really, really like this. I am very, very happy that we chose this. You can see on this edge here, we got a little bit clean off, not to worry. We're going to take the planer. So that right there is how much we took off from that. Now, like I said, even though we had to clean it up a little bit, that took, what, less than a minute? Do the other side, too. When you're using the planer, you'll know that you've got it right when you hear. It's an auditory and a tactile thing. You'll know it when you hear the blade contacting the whole edge, and you'll feel it too. When you're going over high and low spots, you'll feel a bump. You'll feel it, you know, 
you'll feel it bite and then it'll be free and then it'll bite again. When, you, when you're doing it consistently and it's just biting all the time, you hear it always biting, that's when you should probably stop. That nine times out of ten means you have the edge right. It's as good as it's going to get it. It's true. Quit drilling, you hit oil. The rest of that will be cleaned up with sandpaper. I do feel a little low spot. Actually, no, it's a high spot right there that I want to take down. So this is the Okada planer. Um, this is a very nice little tool, but it costs a hundred bucks. I got mine secondhand for like sixty. Um, it is a wonderful tool. It is a delight to use. I could see why someone would spend a hundred dollars for this. I would have difficulty stomaching that. Um, this is a a five dollar Harbor Freight plane that I took, and I filed it by hand. To the same rough kind of shape and the only real difference between these two tools is that the knife the blade on this one is where all the cost is this is a very nice blade it will stay sharp very sharp for a very long time this is one of the worst blades i've ever seen you can visibly see the burrs on it when you buy it but you can sharpen it uh so for five dollars versus a hundred dollars this will do basically the same thing um, I need to sharpen this blade a little bit more, so I'm not going to demonstrate on this one, but I kind of use them interchangeably, depending on what I feel like for the day. And just to be honest with you, I like the look of it. I took it and polished it and, you know, made it look nice. And again, all of this shape I did by hand with a file. But if you need a planer, a mini planer, you can go get one. You don't need to spend $100 to have one. It's the quote-unquote leather, leather working plane. This one will work. Any plane is better than no plane. So, <laughs> um, food for thought. The, the argument about you should buy the best tools you can afford is certainly true, but sometimes the best tools don't have to be the most expensive one. If it works and works well, it is a good tool. Clean this up here. By now, my water should be boiled, so I'm going to go make a cup of mint tea real quick. That takes so quick, I'm not even going to bother putting the Be Right Back sign up. So I'll be right back. Give me just a minute. I'm going to make some mint tea. I'll be right back. There we go. Let that brew in the cup. So, oh yeah. Yeah, I'm very, very happy with that. There's the exterior for reference. And the interior. Man, that's cool. That looks very cool. I like that a lot. I can't wait to take pictures of this. That's how you know it's good when you're sitting there and it's not even done yet, and you're thinking about how you want to shoot pictures of it, that's a good sign. We're going to round the corners of it. These are just the, the My Leather Tool corner punches. And in the exact opposite vein of what I just talked about with the uh, planer discussion, these also cost about 150 bucks. You could just as easily do them by rounding the corners with a knife and a washer and just going around it for around a corner or a nickel or things like that. I used to do that game. I got tired of it real quick. These do it much better than I do, so I shelled out the money years ago, and I have absolutely zero reg regrets about it. <laughs> the moral of the story being, don't take everything I say as gospel. Find out for yourself, and if what you're doing is working for you, then it's probably right. If you're getting the results you want, then whatever you're doing is right for you. I do, a, I do a smaller radius on the top than I do on the bottom. I just think it looks nicer. It's very hard to notice, but when you notice it, you notice it. A 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, I'm not going to bother doing that. Just drop them real quick and send it. <laughs> So this will be an interesting task here. Now we have to prick the holes for stitching. And I'm wondering how well that's going to show up. I need to remember that it actually was better than I thought it was when I did these interior lines, which that thread, for being gray, blends so perfectly between the white and the black that you almost can, can't even see it. If you look very closely, you can just make it out there. But that's how... That's how Damn near perfect, that is, for showing up there. We'll see it against the black, and we'll see it against the black here a little bit, but that's that's going to look quite quite fetching. All right. Taking my wing dividers. I'm having to press a little more aggressively than I normally would like to, just to be able to see it. I think I'm just going to do these one section at a time. Normally I would scribe the line around the whole perimeter, but it's just so hard to spot. I think I'm just going to do it right after. I'm just going to punch right after I've done it. I'm going to start with a smaller. And these are the, uh, the Jun Lin or... Uh, Leatherwork School or Ellen Valentine set of pricking irons. I find these very, very good for the money. I used to use a set of KS blade punches. Those were also very good for the money. But I, I find that I quite like these. That color is so wild. Normally I can very clearly tell when my uh, tines have punched all the way through, but this well, this here, you can't see it at all. That's good. Sergeant, I'm going to switch over to 10 tooth. Working our way in long sections down, down that outside curve. Yeah, generally Russian, I don't need to bother with that, and I actually can when I get down low enough, I can I can make it out. It's damnably tricky though. Up. part like I always enjoy you get it just right when you walk it around one of these corners just right it always feels very good looks good too
antenna through. That's always nice when you're when you're starting your endpoints line up perfectly. That always feels very good. No fudging needed for those stitches there. Those holes just lined up perfectly. Bottom next. Really need this tea today. Had a big weather change over the weekend, and unfortunately, being being very a sinus oriented person. My throat is a little a little sore from uh sinus strain I do overnight. Only in Ohio can you go from like ninety to sixty five in an evening. But that's part of the fun. Like we always say here, if you're not happy with the weather, just wait an hour. How many millimeter in am I from the edge? Uh, I think I'm three. Let's find out. I'm going to say three to three and a half. Technically closer to four from the uh, outside edge to the inside dead center of the stitch is 3.85. Your distance from the edge will vary depending on the spacing of your stitches, the size of your irons, the thickness of your thread, all of these things will affect how you do that. This is just what I do for me. Your mileage not only may, but will vary from mine. I've seen people do that. It strikes me as a little too permanent for my taste. Oh, if you did, I would be thrilled. I, I love Monty Dawn. This is another. This is another uh, might. You might. You might go to Chelsea, or you might see Monty Dawn. My wife is uh big into gardening. She's out there right now, and I I really am not. I enjoy gardens. I like I like viewing them. I certainly enjoy the produce from them, but I have no interest in maintaining or making one. But through the course of watching uh, some of the programs with her, in particular with uh, Britain's favorite gardener, Monty Dawn, I came to really enjoy his method of presentation. I find his enthusiasm for the topic to be infectious, to the point where I now, I rather like gardens. I still have no interest in gardening, but I enjoy a garden, mostly because of Monty Dawn. So, uh... <laughs> I I just I just like him. He he's, he strikes me as a, as a as a genuine individual, which is difficult to come across these days. At least when it comes to uh, television personalities, I get the impression that he really is the man he presents himself to be. Deep thoughts. <laughs> Deep thoughts today. I do appreciate that Monty Dawn in particular insists that uh, if you're for gardening, you need a good belt from a good English leather worker, is what he specifically says. So, I, uh, even as an American, I, I appreciate his sentiment. And again, just wonderful. I don't know if you can see that or not. Might be a little difficult to spot, but pricking holes lined up just perfectly. I don't want to necessarily say that's a rare treat, but it is always auspicious when it happens, so enjoy it when it happens. That's a good sign. That means everything is going just right. 
there's half of it punched and our glue held up very nicely even despite really having to work them through. That's the only bad thing about the Aqualum glue is that it is quite grippy, especially against the pricking irons. You really do have to work to pull those out. As much as I love a good cup of coffee, there are a few things on earth as good as a good cup of tea. Wow. Catch that? So what do we do with that? Easier to fix than you think. That happens more frequently than you think, especially on this kind of thing. Using a phone folder. Or your glass slicker, either or. Immediately after it happens, don't wait. Take it and begin working it back. Work directly on the line. Work around it, too. Now I'm very, very close. I can just barely make it out. Working it this way and that. Applying pressure to it, and you're applying pressure directly to each individual scale. Kind of working in a circle. On exotics, that's much less of a problem than you would think, because the scales usually resist it very well. On something like Batero, that would destroy it. But that's one nice thing about exotics, is they are incredibly resilient. That's why people use them for things like shoes, so on and so forth. They're really, really difficult to permanently mark, and that's why I'm having so much trouble marking a stitching line for it. This kind of thing happens every now and then. Sure the bottom of this is clean, which it is. Here. That'll do. We'll come back to that later. That's one of the risks when you've got something that doesn't mark easily and you're trying to mark it. Especially something that's smooth like this. You can slip occasionally. Forgive me if there's noise of grass cutting going on out there. There's like two or three different lawn mowers that have just started. <laughs> Good, it is. I've punched this first. I'm going to go back and bridge the center here. Just because it's easier, because there's such a height difference here, it would be awkward to try to punch through the top here and also get that. We'd have to rock the irons quite a bit. Whereas here, with the holes punched on both of the thick sides, you just sink the irons right down through the holes, and it's lined up just right there. It's nice and straight. You're not fighting the angle any there. There we go. A 
little bit more. Suckle was tough. So there's our bottom edge. We'll do the top edge and then we'll join it here in the center. Same thing, I'm going to punch the top edge up here first and then go back and bridge it through the center. This is worth taking a, a good bit of time on. Go. Even though this is not exactly a contrasting stitch, it still has to be right. And God forbid if it is a contrasting stitch, if you're off at all, you will notice it <laughs> very, very quickly. Ah. Over to this edge, fun edge. Working around the height difference of these card slots is always kind of awkward. So usually to make it easy, I'll start with a smaller iron, just because it's a little easier to drive through. And it just kind of sets up a guideline for the subsequent larger irons to come through. Hit the desk so hard my mouse moved and almost closed OBS. <laughs> oh. Almost through here. I know, ain't it? <laughs> How the hell is the knife going to fit in there? I was really tempted when I, when I came back from the break and was going to trim it. It took every fiber of my being to not come back on camera holding the chef knife and say, all right, let's do it. But if it were my knife, I'd have done it. But it's not my knife. So I decided that joke was better off inside my head and not actually executed in real life. <laughs> So we're almost, almost done punching the stitching holes. Just got to tighten up. Basically, we've got all the sides done. We just need to do the two corners on this side here, and that's that. And this is the last corner left to do. Hooray! We're not done making noise yet, though. There's still more noise to be made. Actually, this last stitching hole is a little too close to fit with my iron. So I'm going to finish this final last hole with my awl.
There we go. Okay. Put the uh, chisels away. Now, before we actually go about stitching it, we're going to hammer these stitch holes closed just a little bit. It just makes it a little bit easier to stitch. Now we can stitch. Here's our ready to go, ready to stitch med wallet. Get the thread here. Don and I had chosen during our talks this nice kind of steel gray thread. And it's very, like I said, as you can see on the center here, it, it almost seamlessly blends in and we'll get just a hint of it against the black and again just a hint of it on the outside against the white and the black out there. I'm excited to see how this looks all done. General rule of thumb with stitching and with thread length is four times the length of the perimeter is usually enough and when you're at this kind of thickness at three millimeter stitch space you know not a whole lot more than an eighth of an inch thick on the outside that almost always works. I usually give myself a little bit extra just because obviously having more is better than having less. But usually four times the length is enough. So. Now I know between my thumbs is the perimeter of this. Take it to And a little couple inches extra. Come on now. There we go. That's our thread. Heard some absurdities of people weighing the amount of thread just to figure out material cost and things like that. I think that takes it a little far. When uh, threading the needles, I do take the thread and pierce it and pull it back over the other head. Everybody seems to have their own way of doing this, but that's the way I like to do it. Find that it does not add too much additional resistance. This is Venomo number 8 bonded polyester thread. It is lightly waxed from the factory already, so no real need to do any more unless you want to. If it's something exceptionally thick, I will occasionally wax it, but really no need to for this. Bear with me here. I'm going to put the Be Right Back screen on, and I'm going to go ahead and adjust the camera down. I'm going to try to get a better, uh, closer view of the stitching this time. Might as well get the pony out first. This is the same stitching pony I, I've been using since the start. I made it in my garage. It works just fine as it is. I've been trying to get into the habit of standing while stitching. Uh, my stool tends to uh, rock a little bit, so I'm going to clamp this down to the stool. Rather, the pony rocks a little bit, actually. So, yes, this is potentially the most inelegant of stitching setups, but it does work. So. Keep that 
moving around too much while we're doing that. All right, now, like I said, give me a hot second. I'm going to adjust the camera here. Bear with me. Took me a second to remember that I actually can adjust my uh, camera tripod up and down a little bit. There we go. All right. You can see I'm repping Ben Geisler today. He sent me a couple of these shirts and ended up being one of my favorite shirts. So, a question of where to start the stitch. Where would you want to start and end it on this? I generally choose to do it at a place where there will be the least resistance. And on these wallets, that's going to be at the very bottom of the card slot. There's not a lot of outward tension that gets put on that. Yes, you'll get cards built up down there, but versus like here or up here, not a lot of outward pull gets put to this place. So this is a good place to end and also start the stitch. This is a 24-ounce Barry King tapered mall. I like the mauls versus the hammer because there is no indexing needed. No matter how you pick it up, it is always on a striking surface. Whereas with a maul, you would occasionally have to, you could pick it up and be holding it at a 90 degree angle and you would have to stop and adjust it. With that, you just pick it up and you go. All right, so we've got our needles threaded. Try to get them wrapped up on anything here. I glued uh, little magnets to the outside of my stitching pony for the advice of uh, Jim Guthrie, and that's very helpful when you're just starting it out. You can just stick the needle right there. Ooh. After that first stitch, I'll always double check again and make sure that I haven't pulled thread out of alignment. Yep, I've got the same length on both sides. With that, we can begin rocking and rolling. So there was a question earlier about um, do your pricking irons matter as much when it comes to the quality of your stitch? And I think beyond getting this is gonna, it's gonna be a little difficult. You want a good set of pricking irons, but there are a lot of out, there are a lot of them out there that are good and inexpensive. Uh, a lot of people talk about the Kevin Lee's or the KS blade punches. Those are certainly the nicest of the nice, but you can still do nice work without them. Uh, these pricking irons here, from like I said, from Jun Lin, I would argue are probably more middling. Uh, I'd say maybe a Buick instead of a Cadillac, and I make everything with them. Um, I would challenge anybody to find the difference between, you know, my stitches and someone using something from Kevin Lee or something, you know, a, a set of pricking irons double the price of these. I think it comes down to the user. Uh, this was always something that came up with uh, painting cars. People will talk about, oh, I got this nice paint gun and this paint gun does this and this paint gun does that. And it, what matters more than the paint gun is the painter. What matters more than the pricking irons is the leather worker. Being consistent, you can make a good, clean, consistent stitch with cheap irons from Tandy if you just take the time to do it. So, people get all up in arms by using these irons over that irons, and it, I think if everybody just practiced a little bit more, you'd be surprised what you could do with very inexpensive tools. 
I came up with my brand. Thank you for asking, uh, James. Are, is he, are you the fellow with the popcorn from around here? Is this James Marvelous Popcorn? I hope it is. I came up with my brand as a joke. That's, that's the God's honest truth. It started as a joke. Um, I'm a big history nerd. I grew up uh, very fortunate that my grandfather lived next door to me on my mother's side. And uh, he was a World War II veteran. He served in the Navy. He enlisted uh, immediately after Pearl Harbor. And he served in the Pacific War. So I grew up on his knee just drinking in all of his stories about, about the war and about everything. And that really set me on a path. I, I'm a big history nut, in particular, you know, military history, naval history, things like that. So all my life I have been just absolutely dedicated to learning as much as I can about that. And I kind of got into, uh, you know, my, my interests have shifted, you know, from World War II, what he was into, World War I, and to, you know, back further and further. And uh, HMS Dreadnought is an interesting piece of history. It's the first modern battleship, as we understand it. And it's a, it's a very fascinating story behind it that is far too long to talk about today. But I, I, I find those ships very interesting. They occupy a very unique portion of history, and they serve a very important place in it. And as, as, as I had just started leather work, I think I'd only been doing it for maybe a month. And I was sitting at my computer one night, and I, I designed the logo, the Dreadnought logo. Again, more as a joke than anything else, because I certainly wasn't making anything that was worth selling at that point. Certainly nothing worth putting a name to. And I, I showed it to my brother. He said something that stuck with me. And I, he, he always laughs at how I remember this, but this has stuck with me through the years. I showed him that logo, and he said, you know, I told him, yeah, it's, a, it's, quite, it's quite a joke. You know, I may, I've got this logo made for this business that doesn't exist, for these products that I don't know how to make yet. He said, well, maybe it's something to live up to. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, that was important to me. That stuck with me. I decided, you know what, this is something maybe I could live up to. It. Maybe I could become good enough to where this logo is not a joke. Maybe this logo could mean something someday if I work hard enough at it. And so I, I did. I, I started and tried. Uh, much to my surprise, here we find ourselves today. Oh, well, thank you for joining. I'm, I'm glad to... I know it's a little, eh, not late, but it's certainly not early there yet, but uh, in the 50s, what did he do in the Navy? I'm always interested to hear stories from the Navy. My other brother uh, was a submariner. He actually rose, he enlisted and rose through the ranks until he, he left the Navy after 10 years of service. He made chief, which is quite a big deal. Chiefs really are, are the people who run the Navy. So that was, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of him for that. He always laughs at me for bringing it up, but he gave me a set of, uh, keep them down here, this is a set of dolphins that he gave me. These are, they're difficult to acquire the right way. You can buy them on eBay, and he just gave me his, but to actually acquire them in the Navy, they're a little tricky to get. So, I was very, very honored that he would give me a set of them. I keep those open on my, on my bench here. My grandfather was, uh, that he was in the Pacific. He was on the destroyer escort, USS Wildman, DE-22. And like me, he was a short little guy. He was malnourished from the Navy. They wouldn't take him on enlistment day. He was so underweight, which was a you know quite a quite a big problem during the Depression. They turned a lot of guys away, and they sent him home. And he always says, "I went home, and my my mother served me two big bowls of spaghetti." And I went back, and I just made the wait, and they took me in. And he joined the Navy because he would get three meals a day. Living in the Depression, uh, his father had died in the mill. He was killed in a mill accident. It was just his mother, and he had four... Wait a minute. Yeah, he had four brothers. There were five of them. They had, his mother was left alone with five young boys. I think the oldest was his, uh, his brother, Frank. I think he was only 12 or 13 when, when his father died. And she had to take care of him and raise him. So during the Depression, that was pretty tough. They were always hungry. They were never, they were never fed enough. So all of them were a little underweight. But interestingly enough, all five of them joined the Navy. And there was actually a, a newspaper article we had hanging in our basement 
showing that because it was it was kind of a notable event that they would all go there. Now in 1943, Guadalcanal had just happened, and the Sullivan brothers, uh, very unfortunately and famously, were all killed on the same ship. So right at that point, the Navy decided that they would no longer put siblings on the same boats. They parceled them all out to different ships in different places. Some went to the Pacific, and I think one of them even served in the Atlantic for a little bit. But that was his story. And he ended up as a motor machinist mate, first class, working in the engine room. Uh, they had given him a choice of going on submarines or on destroyer escorts, and my grandfather was very claustrophobic, so he chose not to go on the submarine. And still ended up below decks in the engine room, but it was still better than being under the water all the time, even though technically in his spot he was still under the water. A diver, I'll be damned, that's fascinating. My my father in law would love to talk to you. He's a big he's a recreational diver, but uh thank you for thank you for your service, even across the pond there. It's always nice to meet uh meet people who do the thing that I'm interested in. Diving is uh, is an interesting thing. It's something I have no desire to do because it frightens me. So I respect anybody uh anybody bold enough to willingly go down there in that capacity. It's quite a big deal. Interestingly enough, with the divers in the Navy, the mo and this may have changed recently, so I'm going on what may be old information here. But the last I had checked, the most decorated active duty U.S. Navy vessel was uh, USS Parkey, which is actually a special operations submarine. And in the uh, late 80s and 90s, or not in the 90s, but I'm sorry, the late 70s and 80s, uh, USS Parkey was one of the boats involved in a top secret operation called Operation Ivy Bells. And that was involving tapping of undersea communications lines uh, for the Soviet Union, I, I believe the Sea of Okhotsk. And they actually trained divers to go down. Uh, if you've seen the movie The Abyss, they do what's called saturation diving. Well, these guys did it, and that's where The Abyss kind of got the idea for it. Uh, they would go down to extreme depths and work and uh, basically place a nuclear-powered cable tap you just directly listen into and record Soviet uh, naval traffic there. And they got away with this for many years. And uh, these boats were, were continuously issued, you know, presidential unit citations and, and special awards and things like that that were classified for many years, and nobody knew why they kept getting them. Uh, but uh, as it became declassified in the 90s, uh, we learned about it. And the colloquial term for these divers on the boats who would go out and do this uh, the crewmen of the ships simply called them heroes. <laughs> I think it's very apt. I have never thought much about my left-hand or right-hand pulls. I really don't think about it at all. I don't think they're different. The needle got stuck underneath my chair. <laughs> my pulls are a little exaggerated. I do know that just because I'm working. This is... um. This is a very clumsy stitching pony. I would say probably my right hand pull is more exaggerated because when you see me using my right hand to pull the thread out, I'm pulling it away from this wing nut. Otherwise, the actual tensioning of the thread is pretty much the same. Now, you notice when I do this, I'm not casting the threads. In other words, I'm not putting a knot in, in either side of the thread. But when I do stitch it, when I tension this thread, it's important to do it while there is still slack left in this one. And that means I'm able to pull it up. And it's almost impossible to catch on camera. If you look closely in the knife sheath video, there's an up-close shot of me tensioning the thread that will show it. But you'll notice when I do that, when this gets tensioned up, it slips below this. And that's how I get the slanted look on both sides there. It's difficult to explain but it is actually very clearly visible in the knife sheath video. So check that out somewhere right in the, in the middle of it there. Uh, you'll be able to see it.
little little careless with flinging my needles around like that. I got the first side done. And as expected on the exterior, you really, you can barely see it back there. It blends in very, very nicely. It's there if you look for it, but you'd have to look for it. I think we just about nailed every color decision on this wall, and I'm happy. Happy with that. I'm getting that transition of the visible thread against the white to the almost invisible thread against the gray is very neat. I've never done a, a wallet that was quite like this one. So Navy stories are fun. My grandfather has a good one that he would always tell about uh, so my grandfather is Italian, is a first generation Italian. And early in the in the Second World War, you know that we were of course fighting the Italians. And so he unfortunately got in a lot of trouble from some of his shipmates for that. Uh, in particular from a fellow by the name of Joe Grotz who would always bully him. And they would get into frequent arguments about uh him calling my grandfather, you know. Mussolini, and then he, my grandfather would shoot back because Joe Grotz was naturally of German descent. My grandfather would answer back, Heil Hitler, and they would both get pretty upset with each other. And it finally came to a point where it reached blows, and they broke them up. And the way they settled disputes on board their ship was they would go back to the fantail, and they had a pair of boxing gloves that the chief kept. And uh, they would you know, form a ring of the guys, and you would box it out. You were, they were not going to tolerate this kind of mess on the ship. You were going to deal with it. So it came to a point where he and Joe Grotz got into it, and they broke him up, and they they ordered, "Well, we're going to settle. We're going to settle a trial by combat. You guys are going to box each other." And my grandfather, like I said, is small like me, and he was still, you know, coming out of the depression. He was underweight, so he was not very strong. And Joe Grotz was a bigger guy, so he was a little. He was not looking forward to fighting Joe Grotz. But my grandfather positioned himself near one of the hatches that went down below decks, and he could hear them down there trying to find the boxing gloves. And he very quickly uh, sussed out that they were not able to find them, and they were searching frantically to try to find the boxing gloves. So hearing that, he made an educated guess that this fight was probably not going to happen. So he started talking top and saying, where is this guy? I'm a where are these boxing gloves? I'm going to murder this guy. Where is he? Where, where are they? Find him down there. And he started acting up, and <laughs> he ended up intimidating poor Joe Grotz enough to where they, they finally called the fight off, and they ordered them both to shake hands, which they did. And as happens quite often in these cases, he and Joe Grotz became very good friends, and they, they were friends even out of the Navy. So it was just kind of funny how things like that happen. I started off making uh, wallets. Big surprise. I like wallets because they're uh, they offer a lot of creativity, you know, with mixing and matching colors. This you know this wallet being a great example of that. But when it comes down to it, they do not take a lot of time to make. You can make a lot of them and get a lot of practice in, and still you know create something out of it. You know you don't have to spend two weeks making the same thing if it were a bag or something like that. You can spend an evening and actually you know, make something start to finish. So when you're just Early on, I find that very beneficial to be able to have the satisfaction of doing something and also getting in the practice, too. That matters quite a bit. The only way to really get good at something is just to do a lot of it. You can research and study and read and watch videos all you want, but at the end of the day, nothing is going to make you better at it like just doing the thing will. So do as much as you can. Make as many things as you can and try as many different products as you can. Try bags, try wallets, try all of it. There is something to be learned for everything, and all of it will make you a better leather worker. Being well-rounded is a good thing.
one of these days I'll have to go through the bone pile of bad projects. I kept most of them. But every one has a lesson to them. I keep them around for, for that sake. And it's valuable to, uh, to be able to measure your own progress. It's important to be able to, to see how far you've come, if only to make yourself feel better. We're about a third of the way through stitching this now. Getting there. I think what I'd like to do, I think I'd like to get it completely stitched, edge creased. Then I'll do the painting off camera just because it isn't that exciting. But this way, at least at the end of this stream, for those of you who are old or bored enough to stay around till the very end, you'll get to see the finished product at least, minus the edge paint. And I'm torn between white or black or gray edge paint. I haven't quite decided yet. The white looks really good. I have, have to think about that a little bit. It talked about black. Black would certainly work. I just don't know yet. I'm going to ruminate on that as I stitch here. Drawing a blank for any more good Navy stories, but I'm sure something will come to me. White is possible to stain, but with the gentleman carrying this wallet in particular. As I understand it, this is more meant to be a, a walking out wallet. This is something you wear with nice clothing. It's not filled too, too much. But should not be too much of an issue. And, you know, giving it a polish here and there certainly helps. Certain leathers will mark better than others. This being a very dense and also kind of glossy finish, it's a smooth finish, It'll resist marking pretty easily. Now, something like goat skin, white goat skin, that will just absorb anything that touches it. So I'd be much more concerned about it than this. As expected, we have a nice, nice contrast against the black Delaro in there. As soon as I get across this gap, I'll turn it and show you. Getting the first half of the wallet stitched is always tricky just because usually the length of thread is longer than my arms can reach, so I'm kind of fighting that a little bit. But by the time we get around the halfway point, it becomes much more manageable in length. Kind of pick it up a little bit from there. I'm not having to drop the needle as much just to handle the thread. Yeah, that's smart. Here we can, oh, hang on. See there, we've got one side stitched. 
and how it just kind of blends into almost invisibility as it reaches that center there and on the outside. It's really hard to spot, but it's there. And it's there if you look closely enough. Nice transition into the black, over into the white. It's going to be a beauty to photograph. As the like the thread gets shorter, I'm able to kind of pick it up a little bit more now. A little bit of delaminating on the top there usually comes about from pulling the pricking irons through. We work a bit of glue in there. I've always been, uh, I've always appreciated leather. It's a nice material. But being a history nerd, kind of like things that are old, and leather is certainly one of those things that lasts a long time, so kind of get the mystique of that, you know, every, everything tells a story, or so they say. But I really got into it um, because uh, moving into my, my home, with my wife, then girlfriend at the time. We were trying to find some furnishings. I'm going to rethread my needle real quick just because that thread's getting a little frayed. We were looking for some furnishings and we found uh, a leather wall hanger for like storing letters and things like that. And uh, even not being a leather worker at the time, I was not impressed with the quality of it, especially considering the price they wanted for it. And I thought I could do better myself. So I bought. Uh, I bought some tools and some very basic leather from Tandy. I went ahead and I did. I made I made two of the thing we wanted to get for the price of what they wanted for one of them. And I, I was correct. I was able to make it nicer than they did. And we still have it. They still hang in my, my hallway and I put all my mail in it. And then I had a bunch of, lef of leather left over and I had the tools left. And I was, I was looking for a hobby at the time. I was kind of in between hobbies. I've done a lot of different things. Not not all of them productive like this. So I was looking for a hobby that wouldn't make my wife mad. Something that wouldn't collect a bunch of useless stuff. And she suggested, well, you know, you've got all these tools, you should maybe you should consider leather working. Maybe you can make some things that are that are that are neat, and, you know, use some things that we can use and what well, you're right. So I did. I, I I looked into it on YouTube and on on the leather working subreddit and learned as much as I could and just started making things. And I found that um, I really liked it, and I had an aptitude for it. It seemed to kind of be a mixture of all of the things I liked, other hobbies of mine, you know, model making, all of that stuff. A lot of those things kind of apply here, you know, the, the attention to detail. All of that plays a part in how this is done. So I liked it. I enjoyed the hell out of it, and I kept doing it. And That was six years ago in February. <laughs> Hard to believe how long it's been now, but kind of blows my mind a little bit to say that. I've usually not been able to stick with anything for more than a year or two. 
because I get very interested in the thing and then I kind of fall out of it and loses the, the luster of the new thing and I move on to something else. But this one here, I, I made a conscious decision to stick with it. And it's as fun now as it was when I started. That's, actually, it's more fun because I get to, I get to do some really off-the-wall things now. Couldn't do them. I get to look at stuff and pretty much I don't ever have to say, oh, I don't think I could do that. I know I could pretty much do anything now as long as I you know, practice at it. That's a very good, that's a very good feeling to have got to. I feel very good about the things I make now. And I know that in another year or two, I'm going to feel even better about them. I just don't know how yet. <laughs> I always, the big fear is, you know, reaching a plateau to where you aren't able to get any better. But it hasn't happened yet. I don't, I don't know that it ever will. Right, we're kind of getting down to the home stretch now. We're over halfway stitched. Just this other side and then across part of the bottom. We a little spot of delamination there. Something about this calf skin makes it difficult to uh to glue. I think it's very dry. It kind of absorbs the glue before it really has a chance to set. It makes more sense in my head than it does when I say it, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it for the time being anyway. Now you can see the reason why I generally cut the stream short before I get to this part. <laughs> this isn't that exciting. I do always like when I get to the tops of the card slots and I get to stitch them down and snug them. They never sit truly 100% right until they're stitched down. Tension from the thread pulls them down nice and tight. Just looks nice. I 
I do agree. I do, I do love stitching. It is one of the best parts, but it just is not. Uh, I don't know that there's any way to make it exciting other than to cut out about ninety percent of it. <laughs> Again, forgive the forgive the dryness of this part of the stream. There's just not a whole lot to do. People didn't come here to hear me tell sea stories, so I tamp down the inside edge, not the outside edge. Ingress versus egress. Because on the egress side, only the thinnest part of the tines are coming through there. On the interior side, the part I'm stitching into, you're getting, in some cases, if something is exceptionally thick, almost the full width of the tine pushing those, those holes open. You really don't get much of that on the outside. Uh, so really, the the biggest the biggest opening to close is on the interior rather than the exterior. And generally, yes, you do get a little bit of you know puckering and blowout on the outside, but generally, just striking the inside is enough to also close that up. I find that there's almost never a reason to to hammer both sides. When I'm doing, uh, it depends on on what layer I'm doing. So if I'm doing first kind of medium coat that I'm going to heat spread. I usually will go all the way around the perimeter, or if it's again, you know, the final little thin coat that I'm doing with my fingertips, that I can do all around. But on, on those in those in-between coats, the ones that are very thick, I'll do those one edge at a time. Because it is so thick that if you if you don't hold it uh, you know, right side up or upside down directly, it will run. So generally to avoid runs, I'll do one side at a time, let it dry, or at least tack up on the surface. It doesn't need to be fully cured, it just needs to be surface tacked enough to where the wind it sits for about a half an hour on, you know, vertically, it's not going to run. Generally, about 15 minutes is all it takes. Again, your drying time will vary. More humid or, or colder climates will have a more difficult time. Here in the summertime, it can be as little as 10 minutes for me. A needle popped off. Time to rethread it again. It's usually a good indication of how tough your material is. As if in the course of stitching you're able to wear through that little bit of thread you have holding your needle on. Lizard skin is particularly tough. But that's also why I give myself a little bit of extra just accounting for the fact that I may have to snip the thread off and re-thread it here and there. I think we're almost around to the bottom edge. Start heating my filatus up. We're going to need it soon. Go almost. Almost stitched. The gray was definitely a good choice. For as much black as we're using in this, a straight up black thread would have been just a little too much. The gray mutes it down just right and you get that nice contrast against the white. Not an excessive contrast. You generally don't want to punch through more than you need to because, again, the further those tines go through, the wider they're going to open up those holes. The more the more risk you have of, you know, a, a real blowout situation on the back side. So you don't really need to punch through more than uh, more than you have to. And I've, I've gotten to the point where I can usually just kind of tell when enough is enough. 
again, it's just a thing you develop a feel for. So I would say, err on the side of a uh, of less force behind the mall. Just try to get it to where the tips of the tines are just kissing the uh, the outside of your uh, of your surface. Hey, thank you for joining, James. I'm I'm uh, glad you glad you told us your grandfather's story, and I'm glad you you joined in for a little bit. My pleasure. Again, one more spot, needing a little bit more glue in there. Thank you. You're welcome. How did you know? I wanted to. <laughs> ah, there's nothing like a good cup of tea. Punching through too much could potentially open the backside of the hole more than you needed to. So yes, I would say that could be, but that generally is not what most people suffer with. In most cases, it seems to be not holding the chisel properly. Either that or not doing a consistent stitch, not doing the same motion every time. I'd say that's the other big thing. You know, people who do pay attention to where their chisels are placed will think that that's enough sometimes. Not, uh, you know, lose track of the actual, of the stitch itself. That was certainly uh, an issue I had. And I ended up stitching, you'll notice that I stitch backwards from most people. Generally, when you watch tutorials on how to stitch, you're stitching towards yourself. I stitch away from myself, and I start with the right hand rather than the left hand, and this and that. And I, I came to that because I, I was tired of having inconsistent stitches, and I just spent a night trying every possible combination I could get of uh, entrance angle, entrance position, you know, order, stitching this way, that way, until I found one that worked both front and back, and look nice, and then I just never stopped doing that. I just do that every time. And it's, it's evolved a little bit. I don't want to say that I stitch exactly the same way as I do then, but more or less, the order is pretty much the same. And again, like many things with this craft, if what you're doing is working for you and it's producing the results that you want, then it's correct. With, within limitations. I think by the time I finish stitching this, tea should be the perfect temperature. I have never found that to be a problem. I never prepped the thread in any way, shape, or form. If you were doing something with a flat braided thread, that would definitely be a problem. But this, the Venomo MBT, is round all around. So even in the cases where you do get a little bit of coiling, it is impossible to tell. And it is certainly impossible to tell once you hammer the stitches down. So that has just never been something I've uh, felt a need to accommodate for. I am just tickled by this wallet. There were a lot of things that could have gone wrong or could have been very difficult with making this wallet. 
getting the scale pattern to line up on the inside, choosing the right colors to go with it, you know, choosing the right thread colors, choosing the right interior accent, all of that was kind of perilous water to traverse. And that uh, one bad decision there could have really, really affected the overall appearance of the piece. Just looking at it, even in its unfinished state, every single choice we made on this, I am completely satisfied with. Every single one. That's what a good feeling that is. A little bit more glue in that. Uh, linen thread, I just don't use. Learn my lesson from linen thread. And it's funny, every now and then I'll go back to it just kind of for fun, just to see what it's like. And I really don't like stitching with it anymore. I, you know, people talk about how nice linen thread is to use. I don't find it that nice. I'm so used to, to the, the polyester stuff. I have no need to ever go back to linen. I would... For small goods, I would absolutely, positively not recommend it. It is not a, it is not a good choice for small goods. You would have to be exceptionally light on your wear for it not to uh, eventually wear through. We're getting there. Rotate it here. I don't know how much of that you'll be able to see. Needles go. Oh, there it blends in so well I couldn't even find my thread. I had to I had to really get him close to see where you tell me can you see where the thread starts and stops on this spot here can you determine where that is i'm having a hell of a time even being here <laughs> One more, and then back stitch. Back stitch time. Okay. There's some questions in the chat. I'll get to those in just a second.
Again, as I always say, while that glue is still setting, I'm going to hammer it home. Give me a hot second. Tear down the stitching pony. I'm going to change the camera back to face to, to top down. We'll hammer those stitches closed, and then we'll crease it. And I think we'll call it a day at that. And we have a, other than edge painting, we have a finished wall up. Thank you, Ruzba. Uh, no, I really don't adjust my stitch line. Uh, it's kind of set up to be what looks nice by itself and also with the, uh, the creasing tip that I use. Really is, is kind of what determines it. So it generally is not an issue of the, uh, not a matter of the, uh, of the material or the thickness at all. It's more a matter of how far in do I want my crease to be. Take these clamps off here. Again, a very, a very inelegant solution to an elegant task. Right, bear with me. I'm going to throw the black screen up real quick. I'm just going to change the camera around. Stand by. I think I did it upside down. I did. Hang on. I put it back exactly the same way I had it. Doggone it. Oi, oi, oi. Aha, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know why that gave me such fits there, but... Lease up my thread here. Now we can hammer this closed. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Hello, Filaza. You, you flatter me. Thank you for joining. <laughs> I didn't really start promoting my products uh, anywhere other than Reddit early on. I actually had to be convinced by a friend to make an Instagram, which ultimately ended up being a good choice. Uh, Instagram is a tricky one just because the uh, the algorithm is a little hard to decipher. But the biggest thing I can say is this. Instagram 
and most social media places seem to reward consistency. And that means posting every day or every other day. Uh, and that sounds like a lot, but it, it really is not. Uh, I'll, for example, I'll take pictures of this wallet and I'll maybe get eight or ten pictures of it. And in groups of two or three pictures, I'll get three to four days' time, sometimes longer, out of one project. So it's a matter of kind of getting past the idea of putting yourself out there and spacing it out and showing yourself off uh, and doing that consistently. And, and doing good work helps a lot, too. You know, do try to try to make things that people want to see, that people want to buy, and make them as nice as you possibly can. Doing them in, in bold but also tasteful colors helps. I guess just experiment. Just, just keep keep trying. Keep doing different things and, and keep sharing it. Even your failures. Share everything. Do as much as you can. So I do Reddit, Instagram, and Facebook, and now YouTube as well. I'm close to getting, I think, about 9,300 followers on Instagram. And I think I'm 70, 7,200 on YouTube. So 15, 16,000. Then divide that in half, considering most of them are probably bots. So a couple thousand at a pop, which is pretty good. I, I, I'm astonished that, that there are that many people who are interested in what I do. It, it's quite a, quite a remarkable thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's the big thing, is, is posting every day. Every day, or at a minimum, every other day. Really, really helps a lot. So with our stitches here in place... We're going to take our bone folder, and one thing we're going to do that, that isn't talked a lot about, but after you've stitched everything down, and especially with this Aquilim glue, with the sable glue it matters less, but this glue is very sticky. You want to take your bone folder, work it through, and work all the way out to the edges of your stitches there. And what this is doing, this is freeing up any glue that may be residually stuck there, and it will make it for when your customer, when they get the wallet, it will make it easier for them to put their cards in and use it. They won't have to be the ones who fight against spreading out and breaking open any glue spots in here. You should do that for them. And that's what this bone folder is for. And just work it into all the openings, go all the way to the stitches. And this is also a good way to test your stitches, because if anything's going to blow up, you want it to be, to be happening when it's on your workbench and not on the customer's pocket. So, there you go. That's all opened up. Let's go ahead and test it. Let's put some cards in it, see what it looks like. On fresh wallets, I always load the bottom card slot first, just because I find that it's, it's got a little bit of slack to it. It's a little bit easier, and it's a little tougher to do when it's brand new. If you've just finished a wallet and you find that the card slots are a little stiff, don't worry. Put your cards in it and leave it in overnight, clamped in your stitching pony, and it will open up. And it will open up in time as the customer uses it, too. But that's one way you can kind of alleviate that. There we go. Look at that. We just get that nice... Somebody somebody called it an ink blot. That's exactly what it looks like with that. Boy, is that pretty. That is breathtaking. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. So with that all stitched, and remember, earlier on after we cut the corners on it, we, uh, we shaved those edges with the planer. Now after stitching it, we're going to do that again, because the stitching will pucker it a little bit, and it will distort that shape. Not a lot, but enough to make a difference when you go to crease it. So before we crease it, we're going to do some planing and block sanding to finally true up this edge before we do anything else to it. So again. Planer. Nothing different from what we did before. We're just going to take it. Look. Looking at the edges. And with lizard skin, when you're planing it, it's easy. You can get, um, it can look a little jagged just from it contacting the, uh, the scales. That's easily fixed. I'm not sure how well you can see that or not. Yeah, you actually can see it pretty good. So what I did is I took my block sander and I just went over it in this direction. I went over 
the scales, and that'll effectively sand away any rough spots on there. So you can see, try to get on something dark there. You can see the transition there a, a little bit, where it starts to kind of lift up, where it feathers up a little bit here, to where it's smooth down here. We're going to take the rest of that off with our block sander. There we go. Now that now that edge is nice and, and smooth. So if you get a little bit of that, if you get a little bit of edges kind of popping up from your exotics or even from other other leathers, that's a quick way of taking that down. Work across the top now. We don't need to take much down, just a little bit. We're just taking out any residual distortion that tensioning the stitch may have added to this. That should be enough. Now again, we're going to we're going to sand over it again. We're going to take it on. I usually do it on the 45 over this edge. And a lot of times you can actually visibly see the areas that have lifted up. You can see them actually being taken away by the sandpaper. And once we've done that, we're going to go back over this edge. Just smoothing it out a little bit makes it easier for our, our creaser to glide over it. And again, with the sanding block, that's just further further truing up our surface. I believe I had, I must have thrown them away. Let me get it here. Perfect. As I'm always a opponent of doing, I'm going to take a little piece that I trimmed away earlier. And I'm going to test my creaser on that first to make sure that we've got the right temperature. Number one, to make sure that we're not too cold, but more importantly, that we're not too hot. Thank you very much for the tea, dear. That's good. I'm able to kind of hold that in place for quite a long while without it distorting or burning anything. So I think we're at the right temperature. We can go ahead and start creasing this. So forgive me if I'm a little quiet while I'm doing this. This is something you really want to pay attention to while you're doing there. one edge done. Hey, have a good day, Roger. And when you get to these corners, you'll notice that I rotate not just the tool, but the piece as well. You get kind of a double uh, double rotational effect there that makes it easier. Kind of makes it much easier to walk around those rounded corners there. Now on, on exotics, these teeny tiny little flank scales up here are worth noting, especially when you're creasing, because nine times out of ten, they are much softer than other belly scales or things like that. So when you're going over with a creaser, there is a, a strong tendency for the creaser to sink into it, and occasionally it can actually slip off the side there. So when you get to these little flank scales, pay close attention to what you're doing, because it is a, it is a risky zone. 
you generally want to do slower, less tension. Or less pressure, rather. Slower and less pressure. Getting in here is always a little tricky. You kind of have to bend it a little backwards to close to those tight areas there. I have to catch the light just right to really show it there. I always find that nothing really looks right until it has a crease on it. Let's do the outside real quick. We'll finish up the outside. We'll show it off for a hot minute and then call it a day. For those of you who uh, who stuck through this, I, I I greatly appreciate the comfort or not the comfort the company, and I do value the uh, the questions quite a lot. I, I, it, it is nice to have the interaction. I, I I value that extremely more than you could know. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to sit here with this old chunk of coal while I work. I realize it's not the most exciting fare. But I value your uh, your company. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any disadvantage of it? It makes it a little more complicated to do, I find, so I don't do it that way. But I know plenty of people who do crease first and then stitch. Um, oh, as far as... Cre okay. I do... With creasing before stitching, like I just went around and did with the sanding and the, and the block planing of the edges there, if you're not exceptionally careful or if you're using softer leathers... Uh, the stitching will distort the crease line. So I always crease after stitching for that reason there. Uh, kit tools from Amazon, uh, they can work. I generally don't recommend them. Um, I'm not allowed to say too much, but I would advise you to wait a little bit if you're looking for for um, uh, for, for a, a leather working kit. Can't tell you more than that, but just wait a little bit, be patient, and we'll see what happens there. But uh, the Amazon, the Amazon kit, Kits I generally would uh, would avoid. You're better off buying the, the tools individually. But with that said, here we have a, a good look at it. Let me turn it around. They always look a little nicer with the shadow coming across the tops of the uh, card slots, even if it's upside down. This is a... Uh, I would definitely not crease before punching. Punching will absolutely distort it, so no, I would definitely not do that. No, I would definitely crease after stitching and punching. I got uh, I got a little confused as to the nature of your question there, but no crease after crease after stitching. That's beautiful. Very very nice and compact. Very thin. That's only an eighth of an inch thick at the outside edges there. I'm happy with that. What a what a remarkable looking wallet. I can't wait to take pictures of it. Keep an eye on my Instagram in the next couple of days here. 
I've still got to edge paint it, but I'm going to do that off camera just because it's just not that exciting. So a couple days here, I'll have it done, post some pictures of it. Uh, Don, if you stuck through this, thank you very much for, for being patient, letting me wait a week to do this on camera. I'm glad everybody tuned in to see the finish of it. I'll be in touch with you there. We'll get it to you here. Probably a couple days here. But I think I'm going to call it there. I think that's a good day's work. I'm damn happy with that. I can't wait to take pictures of it. Thank you all for joining. Again, if, uh, if you enjoyed this, I, I do appreciate uh, you spending the time with me. There is a thanks button on, on the videos and on the streams. If you feel so inclined, do feel free to, uh, to hit that. Otherwise, tune in next week. We'll see what else we're working on and uh, keep the questions coming. Thank you guys very much. You guys have a good day. I'll, I'll see you next week.